All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, welcome to the first of many live stream noon conferences hosted by MRI Online. In response to the changes happening around the world right now, and the shutting down of many in-person events, we have decided to provide free daily noon lectures to radiologists worldwide. To learn more about um, future lectures and webinars we have coming up, please visit our website. Uh, our software can accommodate the first 500 attendees. To make sure uh, you register and show up on time, the link is provided as a first come first serve basis and we will be putting them on the course after we sign off. Today we're joined by Dr. Mahan Mathur, Associate Professor of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging at Yale School of Medicine. Associate Program Director for Diagnostic Radiology Residency and Director of Medical Student Education in Radiology. Awarded four times the Rail Yale Radiology Teacher of the Year. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mathur. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you very much, Ashley. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Does everyone hear me okay? I'm assuming that's a yes. Um, well, welcome everyone. Um, uh, as mentioned, uh, let's see, people said yes, perfect, thank you. Um, my name is Mahan Mathur, I'm a radiologist at Yale. You can read my credentials over here. Um, uh, I'm really uh, honored to be here today and uh, I really wanna thank um, MRI Online for putting this together and really leveraging uh, technology in order to bring us together in this hopefully temporary era of uh, social distancing. So for the next hour or so, let's forget about what's going on and let's uh, sit back and learn from each other and enjoy uh, learning about the retroperitoneum. We have a couple of objectives uh, that hopefully you'll be able to obtain at the end of this hour. The first is uh, you'll be able to review um, and explain the normal anatomy of the retroperitoneal compartments. Secondly, you'll be able to describe key imaging and clinical features of both solid and several cystic retroperitoneal neoplasms. And we'll finish off by talking about imaging and clinical features of some non-neoplastic retroperitoneal processes. Now, as of now, we had uh, over 100 participants, 128 uh, to be exact. And so everyone's probably going to be at a different stage of training. Some people may be experts in this, some people novices. And so we can all get what we need out of this talk. Um, and so hopefully uh, within these objectives, you can find something that you can learn from. Let's start. Before we get going, I wanna show you five unknown cases. And this is something that uh, I just thought about doing about 45 minutes ago. I will show you five unknown cases and uh, you, know, you can jot down the answers if you want on a piece of paper, you can think about the answers. And uh, if you want, you can chat and uh, text us the answers as well. And we'll see if we can uh, give bragging rights or something else to uh, the person or people who get all five of them right. So this is the first case. I'm not going to describe anything. I'll give you a couple of seconds to look at it, see what you think, come up uh, with one answer. This is the second case over here. Give you a couple of seconds to look at it. Again, one right answer for this. Case number three. Move on to case four. These are MRI images. The sequences are named over here. And last but not least, case number five. All right, so we'll revisit these cases through the talk and I'll give you the answers at the end of this uh, session. All right, so first objective is to talk about anatomy. And so the anatomy of the retroperitoneum is really built around this tricompartmental model. And this has sort of been established at least since the 1960s and it's a great model to explain sort of how um, uh, the different components fit into the retroperitoneum and it's really, built around what I like to call the flagship organ of the retroperitoneum, which is the kidney. And you can see the kidneys over here in this schematic. And uh, 
uh, around the kidneys, you have different spaces. You have the space anterior to the kidney, the anterior pararenal space, the space around the perimeter of the kidney, the perirenal space, and finally, you have this uh, space posterior to the kidney, the posterior pararenal space. Now, the anterior pararenal space is delineated anteriorly by the posterior layer of the parietal peritoneum. Here, this is highlighted in blue. Posteriorly, it's delineated by the anterior renal fascia. It's also known as Chirotis fascia. It's highlighted in red over here. And laterally, it's defined by the lateral conal fascia, here highlighted in green. And this contains several organs of the retroperitoneum, including uh, the ascending colon, the descending colon, uh, the second and third, fourth portions of the duodenum. It contains the majority of the pancreas. But we're not really going to talk about these organs today. We're going to talk about the spaces in between and what grows in the spaces in between uh, within the fat, within some of the vessels, hair, and fibrous tissue. The perirenal space is the space immediately around the kidney and is delineated anteriorly by the anterior renal fascia or gerotis fascia, posteriorly by the posterior renal fascia or zacrocandyl's fascia here highlighted in purple. And this of course contains the kidneys and the adrenal glands, which are not imaged on these, uh, on these images here, but also a variable amount of fat, lymphatic tissue, lymph nodes, um, and other things that we'll talk about a little bit later. And finally, my favorite space is the posterior pararenal space. It's my favorite space because it really just contains fat. So there's not much I have to remember about that. And it's uh, delineated, let me just go back to the last slide, anteriorly by the posterior renal fascia, or zacrocandyl's fascia. Posteriorly, it's delineated by the transversalis fascia, this really, really thin layer that sort of um, surrounds some of the muscles over here and goes out laterally. And then laterally, this extends as the lateral conal fascia. And this fat actually extends laterally, and you can see it as the properitoneal fat stripe on uh, plain films. And so that's the tricompartmental model. And if that's all you kind of want to glean out of the anatomy portion of the talk, I think that's sufficient. That's sufficient to explain most processes. However, uh, it turns out that these fascial layers that I talked about, gerota, zacrocandyl, lateral cone of fascia, are not a single layer but la rather they're um, laminated, made up of multiple layers that are fused. And as a result, they can um, expand and form these expansile planes. And so if we kind of want to push our limits of knowledge um, to the vocabulary that we've already established, it's important to add a few other things. This is uh, the retromesenteric plane, which is the plane that occurs when the gerotis fascia expands. You have the retrorenal plane, which is the plane of the uh, zacrocandyl's fascia when that expands, and the lateral conal plane, the plane when the lateral conal fascia expands. These meet out laterally in something called the fascial trifurcation, and that extends out inferiorly as something called the combined interfascial plane. So if you look at these sagittal images on the CT scan, you'll, and with the retroperitoneal process, and I'm gonna show you a few in a bit, you may often end up seeing a Y shape um, as, the la as the combined interfascial plane uh, goes downwards, forming from the union of uh, the retromesenteric and the retrorenal planes. If we look at on axial images, this is a CT scan with intravenous contrast, it's very tough to see where the combined interfascial plane is, but if I click on the next slide, you can see that it's gonna roughly correspond to a very thin layer, about two to three millimeters at most, that uh, occurs over here, and everything sort of behind this is gonna be part of the retroperitoneum and everything medial to this over here will be intraperitoneal. As we go down inferiorly, again, it's very hard to see that plane. When it's normal, you hardly see it. But if you scroll and uh, imagine where it could be, you'll see that it sort of goes along these dotted yellow lines over here. This is where the combined interfascial plane goes downwards. And as you go down even more inferiorly, very tough to see, but it roughly follows this trajectory. And you can see that it allows processes to go inferiorly and communicate with the presacral space over here. And so if we look at a few examples, we can see over here that uh, this person, I think, had um, an ulcer, the second portion of the duodenum that perforated. 
and had some uh, complications related to that, and as a result, had lots of fluid that were tracking along the retromesenteric plane in this instance. So this is not technically the anterior perirenal space. It's a very uh, well-delineated plane that goes out laterally, allowing processes to sort of communicate from the right side of the retroperitoneum to the left side over here. This was a patient with diverticulitis that was sort of of the descending colon, and as a result, the inflammatory change sort of um, drained and um, expanded the retromesenteric plane, the retrorenal plane over here, as well as portions of the lateral conal plane. So that allowed the inflammatory process to sort of decompress through these different planes. This is another case of diverticulitis where the descending colon gets inflamed and that inflammatory process is sort of um, decompressing through the presence of these uh, retromesenteric, retrorenal, and lateral conal planes, which are expanded. And this was that Y shape that I showed you. Over here, a sagittal CT scan with intravenous contrast, we can see that the retromesenteric plane is expanded, the retrorenal plane is expanded, and downwards, you can sort of see that Y shape as straining through the combined interfascial plane. And again, you know, the presence of these planes allows one to perhaps appreciate and understand how processes that sort of start off in the abdominal retroperitoneal compartments can communicate all the ways down to the pelvis. So this is a patient with uh, pancreatitis and had advanced pancreatitis uh, with uh, necrotizing collections. And you can see that the inflammatory process in the collections are expanding the retromesenteric plane over here, the retrorenal plane, expanding the fascial trifurcation. All this is going downwards, expanding a combined interfascial plane on the left side. On the right side, we hardly see that plane because it's normal. If you follow this downwards again, you can see that it's following the expected location of the combined interfascial plane, and finally going down to that presacral space. So all of a sudden, we can appreciate how something that started off in the pancreas um, is now communicating with that presacral space. And as we sort of finish off the anatomy portion of this, um, the perirenal space also has um, ways that it sort of communicates with the other uh, retromesenteric and retrorenal planes. And it turns out that the perirenal space contains these uh, lamella, which are really channels and that allow um, for processes to decompress um, within the perirenal uh, space into the anterior, into the retromesenteric and retrorenal compartments. And so we can see that uh, in this case over here, uh, this person has a subcapsular hematoma uh, compressing the left kidney over here and uh, causing mass effect. And the body itself is trying to decompress it by opening up these different channels and allowing some of that hematoma to communicate with both the retromesenteric and retrorenal planes. And that communicates inferiorly to the pelvis via the combined interfascial planes. This is another case that I uh, just saw last week that sort of demonstrates some of these findings nicely. This patient, um, this is an older study on the patient, had a history of lymphoma, had uh, infiltrated the left kidney, has adenopathy over here. Uh, but the processes had also sort of um, uh, expanding these uh, conduits within the perirenal space, allowing the retrorenal plane to be nice and lumpy bumpy, as you can see over here, and the retromesenteric plane to be lumpy bumpy. So you have soft tissue that's sort of exiting and uh, the perirenal space through these different planes. Again, you can see on the sagittal image that Y nicely delineated, uh, much more uh, thick within the retromesenteric plane, and it goes down and it communicates inferiorly uh, via the combined interfascial plane, which is very, very thickened in this instance. So this is a case of lymphoma um, of the left kidney that's sort of decompressing through these channels um, and expanding all these different planes. And so we've achieved our first objective, going through the normal anatomy of the retroperitoneal compartments. Remember the tricompartmental model, and if that's all you want to remember, that's probably sufficient. But once you've mastered that, um, it's important to sort of add to your vocabulary the different planes that we've talked about, the retromesenteric, retrorenal, et cetera, because it allows us to understand how different compartments in the retroperitoneum communicate with each other from right to left and from uh, cephalate to caudal. So now move on to talking about retroperitoneal neoplasms. And there are a lot of retroperitoneal neoplasms and uh, really no talk or paper 
would be exhaustive enough to cover every single little thing that can occur. So I'm just going to touch upon several of them. Um, and we're going to talk specifically about uh, sarcomas, primary sarcomas of the retroperitoneum. We'll also talk about neurogenic tumors. Um, we'll also touch base on metastases and lymphoma, which are actually very commonly seen in the retroperitoneum. And I'll finish off with talking about a few cystic neoplasms. So starting with sarcomas. Now, good news is that sarcomas are very uncommon. You can see that um, incidence of cases of uh, one to three cases per million. Um, but the bad news is that when they do occur, they almost always are malignant. About 80% of them will be malignant. They tend to present in patients around the fifth or sixth decades of life, and they're rather large when they present, uh, oftentimes more than 10 centimeters on presentation. The five-year survival is not great. A lot of this depends on the histologic grade of the individual neoplasm, that is the degree of dedifferentiation. It also depends on the type of sarcoma that you have, uh, the histologic subtype. But also, even if it's something that's relatively uh, benign or indolent, um, the survival rate may not be great because, as I said, they tend to grow very, very large and it is very difficult for surgeons to get tumor-free resection margins. So the mainstay of treating these retroperitoneal sarcomas is surgery. You have to try to take it out if possible, but because they get so large and because they can grow in this um, space in the retroperitoneum for a long time before they come to presentation, it's very tough to get tumor-free resection margins. And so that also plays into the overall prognosis. We're going to talk about sarcomas again. There are many different types of sarcomas, so I'm only going to touch base on the three most common ones. Liposarcoma is the most common. It'll account for about 40% of all primary retroperitoneal sarcomas. And it also consists of different histologic subtypes. And you know, to be honest, I don't typically like committing these things to memory, but I, the only times I do commit it to memory is because if there are some um, uh, imaging findings of them or some clinical significance. So within liposarcoma, you have different groups. The first group consists of an atypical lipomatous tumor, ALT, well-differentiated liposarcoma, and dedifferentiated liposarcoma. The second group often includes myxoid and round cell tumors, while the third is pleomorphic. And so one thing you need to know is as you go from one to three, the prognosis gets worse. And the other thing I'll point out is that these two entities, atypical lipomatous tumor and well-differentiated liposarcoma, are essentially the same histologic entity. So why do we have two different names for them? Well, it turns out this is more a pathology um, a differentiation or pathologist differentiation, I should say, in that when they see tumors that look the same, but when they occur within the extremity, um, they'll call it an atypical lipomatous tumor. When it occurs in the retroperitoneum, they're prone to calling it a well-differentiated liposarcoma. And that simply is because the same tumor occurring in the extremity will have a much better prognosis. It's much easier for the surgeons to take it out. The, um, the uh, likelihood of uh, recurrence of that site is very, very low, and so they chose to give a different name to it. Um, and also, some pathologists, uh, you know, have um, their own preference thinking that, uh, you know, something like a well-differentiated liposarcoma, as we'll talk about, is a tumor that does not metastasize. And so, because it does not metastasize, it doesn't warrant uh, the name sarcoma. So they like to call it a typical lipomatous tumor. All that you need to know is that if you see this in your reports, ALT or well-differentiated liposarcoma, it's essentially the same entity. Lyomar sarcoma is the second most common primary retroperitoneal sarcoma at an incidence of about 30%. The third most common is what we used to call malignant fibrous histiocytoma. Now, the updated terminology is actually undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, I'm sure Many of uh, you people on the call will, will know that, uh, but I do find that um, when I was training, it was called an MFH, and so just I'll use both in this instance just to sort of make that connection with anybody who's used to hearing it as a malignant fibrous histocytoma. So liposarcomas, well-differentiated, are the most common, and as you can imagine on imaging, they contain fat. Uh, mostly composed of fat. They may have a few septations, but if they're present, they will be very thin. Uh, you know, we're talking about uh, millimeters, hairline thin. They may have a few nodular components, but again, the nodular components are going to be small, typically less than a centimeter, and they'll exert mass effect upon the organs around it. 
I mentioned it's a very low grade tumor and it does not metastasize. The only problem is if you don't get tumor free resection margins, there's a good chance of local recurrence. You do need to monitor these patients um, periodically, even once resected. Now, some of you on the call may think, well, you know, you have a, a mass like this looks um, uh, like it contains fat. Why don't we just call it a lipoma? And that would be a very good question or very good consideration, except it turns out that pure lipomas are exceedingly rare in the retroperitoneum. So this is a case of a lipoma, and the reason I know it's a lipoma is because they actually resected this out. The point here is that when you see a fat-containing lesion in the retroperitoneum, even if it's simply containing fat, no other complexity within it, it needs to be evaluated as a well-differentiated liposarcoma till proven otherwise, uh, because lipomas are very, very rare. And if you biopsy these lipomas, um, you could miss out on the small component that would make this a well-differentiated liposarcoma. Therefore, biopsy is often not encouraged. If you can take it out, it suggests that you do take it out. This is opposed to D-differentiated liposarcoma. Now, this can occur de novo, but can also occur in up to 15% of well-differentiated tumors over the course of about seven to 10 years. A well-differentiated tumor could potentially become D-differentiated in up to 15% of patients. And as you can imagine, these just look more complex. They will contain some fatty components, as you can see over here. They're going to have much more soft tissue. They're going to have some calcifications. They're going to have nodular components that are greater than a centimeter in size. Why does dedifferentiation matter? Because these tumors can metastasize. So well-differentiated tumors won't, but dedifferentiated tumors can. And so this is an example of a patient who over a decade uh, was unable to get resected for their liposarcoma, but was followed to make sure it didn't um, uh, metastasize or get too uh, large in size. Um, and over 2005, you can see the tumor over here, mainly composed of fat, a few imperceptibly thin septations. And just over time, the tumor gets larger, but more concerning. Um, certainly in 2008, you start to get soft tissue components form, and these soft tissue components start to get larger and larger and larger. There are new and enlarging calcifications that also form during this period of time. And so this is an example of a well-differentiated liposarcoma that over a decade has undergone dedifferentiation. Another example over here, coronal CT scan. This is over a course of three years, mainly fat-containing tumor with some soft tissue and uh, calcified component. Probably that component was dedifferentiated at this time, but certainly over a period of time, uh, three years grew much larger with the calcium also growing larger. So typically when I'm looking at well-differentiated liposarcomas on the surveillance imaging, um, I'm not so much looking at the fat as looking at the soft tissue components and seeing how they're doing over a period of time. Mixoid liposarcoma is another category of liposarcoma. And this is an interesting tumor in that it contains an abundance of mixoid gelatinous components. You can see this tumor over here in the pelvis. Um, on the CT scan, has low density, certainly looks like fluid density, has some interspersed areas of fat, so we should be suspicious that this is a liposarcoma. If we were to just look at the uh, T2-weighted imaging, it looks quite bright, and so you would think that this is uh, maybe a cystic neoplasm, but unlike any cystic neoplasm, when you give contrast, this enhances. There's heterogeneous enhancement. It doesn't have to be hypervascular. Even low-level enhancement is fine. But when you see uh, a tumor in the retroperitoneum with T2 hyperintense components, which enhance, and has sliver of fat in it, you've got to think of a mixoid liposarcoma. So this here is a patient with liposarcoma. You may be familiar with this. This was our uh, unknown case number one. You can see a large liposarcoma centered in the perirenal space, pushing the kidney um, cephalate to the right. Um, and this here uh, is also a fat-containing mass, looks very complex, and uh, you could be uh, mistaken into calling this a liposarcoma. But of course, this is a renal angiomyolipoma. You can see a claw sign and this little knuckle of tissue that's emanating from the kidney. And so these two are vastly different tumors that are treated differently. And so it's important to sort of recognize and see if you can see whether it's coming from the kidney, in which case it's going to be an angiomyolipoma. Another potential mimic on this uh, axial CT scan, a fat-containing mass in the retroperitoneum. You may be tempted to call it liposarcoma, 
but always look at uh, every available plane uh, when you're evaluating these cases. This is a super renal mass. You don't see the right adrenal gland. This is a myelolipoma of the right adrenal gland. Again, uh, a benign lesion um, that is treated and evaluated very differently than a liposarcoma. Lyomyosarcoma, as you recall, the second most common primary retroperitoneal sarcoma. And what you're going to look for in lyomyosarcomas is contiguous involvement of vessels. So you can see this lesion over here, heterogeneous mass that's inseparable and expanding the inferior vena cava. Um, you got to think that could this be a lyomyosarcoma? Cystic changes and internal necrosis have been described within these lesions. Uh, but calcifications are quite uncommon. So if you see involvement of a vessel with areas of necrosis in the mass, think of a lyomyosarcoma. This was a case, this was our second unknown case, of, uh, which was a lyomyosarcoma. You can see that in this instance, there's actually quite a large component that's extravascular, but it is contiguous and involves the IVC. So an intra and extravascular component in this instance of a lyomyosarcoma. It can be completely intravascular, as seen in this case over here, where it's um, uh, involving the uh, renal vein and IVC. And they've also described them as extravascular. In this instance, there's probably some vascular involvement that, uh, of some vessels that we're not seeing. But when you look at them on imaging, um, it's hard to find that component. And so this was a patient who had a history of breast cancer and had these nodes sort of, or this mass sort of pop up in the retroperitoneum. And we thought that was unusual because there was no disease elsewhere, and for nodes to pop up here in the retroperitoneum from a breast cancer would be unusual. And over time, you can actually see that it grew, and this was actually resected and turned out to be a lyomyosarcoma. This is another interesting case uh, to show how subtle these findings can be. This patient had a uh, renal cell cancer, and it was being monitored over a period of time. There was an exophytic mass arising from the right adrenal gland, or at least we thought it was an exophytic mass arising from the right adrenal gland over here very close to the IVC. Uh, we presumed it was an adenoma, and we just followed it over a period of time. But you can see that over a period of time, you have a knuckle of tissue that starts to invade the IVC here. That knuckle becomes more nodular and more invasive. This was resected, and this turned out to be a lyomyosarcoma separate from the adrenal gland. And this turns out to be a lyomyosarcoma that arose in the adrenal vein. So the point here is that sometimes uh, these sarcomas, as you know, can grow quite large when they present, and it may be just very difficult to know where this is coming from. So we thought this could be a primary adrenal cancer, like an adrenal cortical carcinoma. Turns out the adrenal gland was okay over here, and this was a tumor that was arising in one of the adrenal veins. So sometimes, uh, you know, when it gets quite large, these things can be quite challenging. And the last sarcoma that I'll talk about is the undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, formerly known as malignant fibrous histiocytoma of MFH. And uh, the imaging features here are really nonspecific. Um, calcifications have been described as being more common in these tumors, up to 20% of these tumors. But overall, this just appears very heterogeneous. Cystic changes, possibly due to some necrosis. There's often hemorrhage in it. So we'll see bright signal on T1-weighted images. The enhancement will be quite irregular. And uh, somewhere in the literature, someone saw this and thought this looked like a bowl of fruit. And so that's also been described. But the point here is that uh, you're not going to be able to make a specific diagnosis. And this often is a diagnosis of exclusion, uh, at least based on imaging. And so if we review the sarcoma clues, and just to break it down very simply, if you see a retroperitoneal mass, a primary retroperitoneal mass that contains fat, it'll be a liposarcoma. And then you can look for other clues to see if you can kind of place it within one of those histologic categories. If you see a tumor that has involvement of vessels and or, or with extensive cystic changes and necrosis, you're going to think of lyomyosarcoma. And undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma is going to be very tough to call on imaging. Um, if you don't see fat, if you don't see involvement of vessels, a mass uh, has some calcifications, perhaps it's an undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. But again, very tough to make that call on imaging. So that covers our sarcomas. Let's move on to neurogenic tumors. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk about neurogenic tumors is it's often uh, something that I still just forget to put on a differential diagnosis. 
and then it comes back as a neurogenic tumor. And I think, oh yes, that's, that's what it could have been. I always forget it. And so I like to sort of make a point to uh, include it and talk a little bit about it in this retroperitoneum talk. And so these neurogenic tumors can arise from the nerve sheath. It can be schwannomas, neurofibromas. We have malignant nerve sheath tumors as well. We'll talk a little bit about those. They can arise from the sympathetic ganglionic cells. You have a family of tumors there, neuroblastoma, ganglion neuroblastoma. These are seen in uh, pediatrics and uh, an adolescent population. We'll touch base on ganglion neuromas that are seen in adults. And finally, the parasympathetic ganglionic cells, which give rise to paragangliomas. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. We'll start off with schwannoma. And unfortunately, schwannoma does have a nonspecific appearance. But I think it's something good to sort of just think about. And whether you include it or not in your differential is really based on the lesion itself. But it's important to think about when you see a paravertebral mass. Um, it can have a variable amount of calcification and necrosis. This lesion here, none of us could have thought it was a schwannoma. Um, in fact, we may think it's a leiomyosarcoma because you don't see the IVC. Perhaps it's invaded. This turned out to be a schwannoma. So a paravertebral mass, possibly when you have expanded uh, neuroforaminal canal as well, I think schwannoma is a good thing to think about. Neurofibromas uh, can be isolated or they can be seen in the context of neurofibromatosis one, in which case you'll see multiple or a plexiform neurofibroma seen in this case. And one of the clues you can see with neurofibromas, and you can also sometimes see them with schwannomas, is this target sign on MR imaging where the central nerve is relatively T2 hypo intense and the periphery has a myxoid matrix. And we talked about myxoid matrix and the uh, myxoid liposarcoma. So the periphery is bright on T2-weighted imaging. So when you see that sort of target sign, that's also been described on ultrasound and other modalities, um, got to think about, could this be a, a nerve sheath tumor? Compared to schwannomas, uh, neurofibromas and certainly plexiform neurofibromas have an increased risk for malignant degeneration. And speaking of malignant degeneration, this is an example of a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. You can see on the plain film, a bunch of distended loops that an opacity of gas on the left side of the abdomen looks like these loops are maybe even being pushed away. Maybe there's a mass effect. If you look at the imaging on the CT scan, looks a predominantly low density mass quite complex on the MR images, um, has T2 hyperintense component, lots of thick septations within it. This turned out to be a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. These can arise de novo. They can also be associated with NF1, and they can also be seen occasionally status post radiation treatment. So particularly if you have young patients who got radiation in the belly, perhaps for a tumor like lymphoma when they were young, um, over the course of uh, a decade or so, they can potentially develop these peripheral, uh, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. Unfortunately, based on imaging, it's very difficult to differentiate um, this uh, as a benign or a malignant uh, nerve sheath tumor mass. But you, know, you can kind of use um, common sense to suggest that it may be more malignant, particularly if it's rapidly increasing in size, if clinically the patient has new neurological symptoms, or just in general, the larger it is, certainly greater than five centimeters, and if the margins are ill-defined, if internally it looks more complex, you're going to suggest that potentially it could be a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. Ganglion neuroma comes from the sympathetic nerve cells. Um, again, a very difficult tumor to call prospectively. On imaging, it's been described as having sometimes lobulated mordens, tends to be low density in its appearance. Uh, a world appearance has been described on uh, T2-weighted imaging on MR. We have concentric circles within this lesion. They may occasionally have some calcifications. Uh, this uh, has a relatively good prognosis. You can see this mass over here adjacent to the IVC. Tough to call that prospectively as a ganglion neuroma, but potentially given its paravertebral location and potentially given its a somewhat world appearance internally, we could consider that this may be of neurogenic origin. As I mentioned, ganglion neuroblastoma, neuroblastoma, well, these are seen in the pediatric and young uh, adolescent population. And uh, unfortunately, they tend to be more aggressive neoplasms. This tends to have a relatively good prognosis. This was an unusual case of a ganglion neuroma that I'll just share with you, but has quite atypical features. Uh, a large mass looks actually quite low in its density. It's displacing the right uh, 
uh, iliac vasculature anteriorly. It's squeezing the left internal iliac vein over here. If you look at it on the coronals, we can see the right uh, external iliac vein looks patent, and the left one is actually thrombosed. So this was a large ganglion neuroma with mass effect causing a, a thrombus in the left lower extremity. Paraganglioma, uh, these are from the parasympathetic ganglionic cells. When they arise in the uh, adrenal gland, we call them pheochromocytomas. Elsewhere, we call them paragangliomas. And it turns out that extra adrenal paragangliomas are more aggressive than pheochromocytomas, and only about 40% of them may have elevated calicolamine levels. On imaging, they tend to be very hypervascular. So you can see this lesion over here is quite hypervascular. And uh, if they do appear heterogeneous, it may be because they sometimes have internal hemorrhage within them. And so these uh, sometimes have been described, at least in the adrenal gland, as uh, having light bulb uh, signal. And I don't know how accurate that always is, but one thing that we do see somewhat consistently is their hypervascularity. This is a case uh, I show my trainees from time to time, and they look at it and um, it's quite a large tumor here, but on the axial, sometimes it can be tough. You know, this is the aorta. You may be tricked into thinking this is the IVC and that this is just something else adjacent to it. Or you don't notice this. It turns out that this tumor is between the aorta and IVC on the coronals, and this is a paraganglioma. Again, notice the hypervascularity within it, a key feature of paragangliomas. And they can be single, they can be multiple. You can see in this instance, in the retroperitoneum and other hypervascular mass, there are areas of heterogeneity, but by and large, quite hypervascular. Hypervascular, another mass seen more posteriorly over here. And this one, of course, we look at it, and uh, oftentimes uh, we consider this one a not mini. We see a large mass over here, right at the bifurcation of the aorta. You can see it on the coronals as well. Peripherally hypervascular, internally not so much. This turns out to be another paraganglioma at the famed organ of Zucker Candle, right at the aortic bifurcation, just beneath the inferior mesenteric, uh, vas inferior mesenteric artery. You see something like this, you've got to think of a paraganglioma, uh, an extra adrenal paraganglioma. If you want a nuclear medicine confirmation, in this case, MIBG is the best test to get. You can see over here, uptake of this paraganglioma on the MIBG images. So that covers neurogenic tumors, the nerve sheath tumors, uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic tumors. We'll move on to METS and lymphoma. And we look at lymphoma, it's the most common retroperitoneal tumor. I believe we can maybe recognize this case as one of our unknown cases, a case of lymphoma. Uh, there are two categories, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. And there are certain imaging clues that we look for to make a prospective diagnosis of lymphoma. Uh, we notice that lymphoma often, when, it involves, when it's involved in the retroperitoneum, will lift the aorta off the spine, called the floating aorta sign. Sandwich sign has also been described where you have masses of uh, uh, lymphoid tissue that are essentially surrounding vessels, um, with the vessels appearing as the condiments or the contents of a sandwich and the lymphomatous masses as the uh, bread. Another key feature, of course, is that it tends to encase vasculature without causing any uh, organ damage. So if you see over here, the artery is completely encased, but this is perfused perfectly. Over here, the artery is completely encased, but again, the uh, kidney is perfused uh, perfectly. This is lymphoma, and um, we can see in the perivenal space has a reasonably distinctive appearance. It can appear as one mass, it can appear as multiple masses surrounding the kidney. It can also have this very ill-defined sheet-like appearance. And when you see that sort of soft tissue surrounding it, um, you can think of uh, potentially lymphoma. Always like to look at the occasional plain film to see uh, what I'm missing uh, retrospectively. So this was a plain film here. And uh, this is the left kidney. You can see kind of the outline of it. The right kidney looks a little bit more dense. If we look at it on the um, CT scan, we can see that there's a mass in the perirenal fat. This is, uh, turns out to be a METS from melanoma. So melanoma can certainly metastasize anywhere. And uh, certainly the retroperitoneum uh, will not be spared in this instance. And this is an important cancer to remember in terms of uh, metastases, and that's testicular cancer. And so this is a patient who had a known choriocarcinoma 
and um, testicular cancers uh, like to uh, have nodal metastases to the retroperitoneum, typically at the entry point of the gonadal veins. Um, this was a little bit lower down, very aggressive tumor actually that invaded some of the vessels, causing some uh, collaterals to form and in fact invaded the bowel as well. This was choriocarcinoma mets. And this was an interesting case of a young uh, gentleman who had been doing a lot of sit-ups, had some pain, got an ultrasound. Uh, they saw a hematoma, what they thought was a hematoma, told them to go back home. He came back uh, a few days later with more pain. This time they got a CAT scan. And it turns out that uh, there's actually a, a thick uh, rimmed mass in the retroperitoneum. And uh, you know, if you were considering primary retroperitoneal tumors, maybe sarcoma may be a good possibility, but it's a young gentleman uh, with retroperitoneal mass and no other history. You got to think about testicular tumor as a primary neoplasm. And so when we did the ultrasound, we actually see that there's a uh, coarse calcification in the, person's, in the patient's right testicle. This was all removed, and this turned out to be a burned out testicular tumor. Quite an uncommon entity where the thought process is that the patient had a testicular tumor, it did metastasize. But for a variety of reasons, the primary tumor regressed, uh, but the metastases persisted. And so this was a burned out testicular tumor. We'll move on to cystic neoplasms now. And you know, just like solid neoplasms, there are lots of different varieties of cystic neoplasms. Um, I'm only gonna go through these three because um, they're uh, relatively common, I would say. But uh, again, the list is exhaustive. So lymphatic malformation, we do see these from time to time. It's a developmental abnormality where the lymphatic tissue fails to communicate, um, and it results in these low-density masses that are cystic, but they may have some variable signal in MR imaging due to the chyle content. It can have fluid fluid levels within them. One of the key features is that it sort of insinuates between multiple structures and multiple uh, compartments. Um, and so when you see a lesion that sort of insinuates is low in density, maybe fluid fluid levels, got to think of lymphatic malformation. Patients are often asymptomatic. However, if it gets very large, it can result in pain and distension. And this is an example of lymphangiomatosis where you have a very large lymphatic malformation and really multi-system lymphatic malformations involving, again, multiple compartments. And so um, it can be more infiltrated in its appearance, can occasionally have foci of calcium, but again, we have a large mass involving multiple compartments, got to think of the um, sort of spectrum of lymphatic malformations. And this was the answer to one of, uh, I think it's the fourth unknown case, a tail gut cyst. Um, and this is something that, uh, you know, we see not uncommonly, and the literature would suggest it's not very common, we do see it from time to time. And it's almost always an incidentally found uh, lesion. And the key finding here is that it's in the presacral location. Uh, again, you look at the literature, they'll describe it more often in middle-aged women, but we've seen it in males and females. It's from uh, an embryonic hindgut remnant. And the key is the location, which is presacral. The fact that it looks multiloculated, so on the T2-weighted images, I was trying to show you that there's you know, one cystic component here, one here, one here, one here, one here. And they may have variable signal because of a variety of uh, internal hemorrhage or protein content. Um, and they won't enhance internally. The peripheral aspect of the cystic lesion will enhance. Um, and so what do you do with these when you see these? Uh, you know, you, you call it as such. It's a tail gut cyst. The other name for this is a retrorectal hematoma. So some people gave that answer. You'd also be correct. You do need to actually take this out because there's a small risk of malignant degeneration one series that I read uh, was up to 14%. And that, that seems quite large to me, but that's what's out there in the literature. Um, and oftentimes it's quoted that squamous cell cancer is what it uh, degenerates to, but I've seen it degenerate to all sorts of tumors. And so I suppose it's not as important to know the exact histology that it differentiates to, but know that it can. And so when you see this and somebody asks you, what should I do with it? Well, they should see a surgeon, see if they can take this out safely. So that covers our neoplasms. We have one last objective to get through some non-neoplastic retroperitoneal processes. And these are the four that I'm gonna talk about. Most of these here are gonna be very, very, very uncommon, but you may see it in your practice occasionally, rarely, and hopefully I can give you some clues to, to make the right diagnosis.
So I'll start with retroperitoneal fibrosis, and it's actually a, a, a disease that encompasses um, you know, a range of findings and diseases, and, and ultimately what happens is you have proliferation of a fibroinflammatory tissue that sort of the epicenter of which is around the infrarenal abdominal aorta. It can also involve the IVC and iliac vessels, and it likes to envelop ureters. Now, there's a laundry list of things that can cause retroperitoneal fibrosis, but most commonly, it's idiopathic in up to 60% of cases. And this is really rare. All right, some studies suggest that it's probably maybe a little bit more common than we thought, but ultimately, this is a rare diagnosis. We don't see this every day, maybe once or twice a year. It's seen more often in males, and it's seen um, often in the fifth to seventh decades of life. But what I want you to remember about this disease, and something I didn't appreciate till a little bit later on, is that it's actually a dynamic disease, um, in that you know it's called fibrosis, but in the early stage of the disease, it actually consists of very edematous tissue that's highly vascular, and that that fibrotic component really becomes uh, more manifested in the late stage of the disease. We have a reduced inflammatory infiltrate and more uh, avascular hyalogenized collagen content. And so why is that important? Well, the reason is that if we can detect the stage, the early stage, perhaps this is more amenable to medical therapy, or if it's in the late fibrotic stage, medical therapy doesn't work as well, and you may have to um, do some surgery to sort of free up the ureters from the disease um, and free up vessels from the disease. So this is what it looks like on, uh, on imaging, on CT imaging. It's an ill-defined sheet-like mass, the borders of which are irregular. Now, this is not always true, but I like to remember that it involves typically the anterolateral borders of the aorta, and that it likes to spare the posterior border. You can see this mass over here, sheet-like mass forming the epicenter, which is around the anterior and lateral aspects of the aorta going down the iliacs. Posteriorly looks pretty okay over here. And it can involve the ureters because they go right in this location. And you'll often see medial deviation of the ureters. That's a characteristic finding when it, enwraps, the, when it wraps around the ureters. And um, quite a large number of patients can actually present with obstructive uropathy because of that obstruction. This is another case of retroperitoneal fibrosis on a reformatted coronal image, how you can see that the ureter is being pulled in medially. This one's also being pulled in medially, but this kidney's not working as well, so we don't see the excreted contrast here. So it likes to pull in the ureters, and occasionally it'll also uh, encase vessels resulting in collaterals and deep vein thrombosis. So this was another uh, case of retroperitoneal fibrosis. You can see the soft tissue over here. You can see that somewhere more inferiorly, it's obstructing the ureter. We can see a lot of collaterals that are developing because it's also enveloping the IVC and some of the venous vessels. And you can see that there's a DVT as a result of that as well. And we talked about the early stage and the late stage. And so how does one go about potentially differentiating that? It's quite hard on uh, CT imaging. PET imaging may be a little bit more promising in that um, early stage will have a little bit more FDG avidity. On MR imaging, um, chronic disease tends to be T1 and T2 hypo intense, as you can see over here. When you give contrast, there'll be minimal enhancement. And I want you to sort of compare that to what active disease looks like, where you know it looks sort of on a non-contrast CT like soft tissue on T1 weighted images, relatively hypo intense, but on T2 weighted images does look quite markedly hyper intense compared to the other case, and noticeably hypervascular. Um, on post-contrast imaging. So if we can catch it in the early stage and let our referring providers know about it, potentially this is amenable to some of the medical therapies that they have out there. This is always uh, a nice uh, thing to remember. How do you differentiate this from a common retroperitoneal tumor that's lymphoma? Well, retroperitoneal fibrosis, as I said, spares the posterior border. As I mentioned with lymphoma, it lifts the aorta off the spine, typically. And retroperitoneal fibrosis obstructs ureters, can obstruct vessels, lymphoma, as, in, as seen in these two cases, well, lymphoma does not tend to do that. Lymphoma will envelop vessels without causing obstruction. Um, potentially can cause that if it gets very, very large and bulky, but by the most part, it doesn't uh, cause any sort of um, obstruction to vessels or the ureters. <laughs> 
So that's RP fibrosis. We can start to get to some more exotic diseases as we finish up this session. This is a case of Erdheim-Chester disease. It's a non-longhand cell histiocytosis. Clinical presentation is variable. Uh, patients can be asymptomatic. They can can have bone pain, weight loss, malaise, fever. And on imaging, you get characteristic bony lesions, which are bilateral, symmetric, and uh, they're sclerotic involved in the metaphyseal and diaphyseal areas of long bone. This is taken from the literature. Um, extraskeletal manifestations are seen in about 50% of cases, and the most common extraskeletal manifestation is in the retroperitoneum. And uh, it likes to form this perinephric rind of tissue. You can see in this case over here, um, around the left kidney, on the coronals, you can see it over here as well. And this was our last unknown case where you can see that rind of tissue that's surrounding both kidneys and a patient uh, who also had bony lesions. Um, this was Erdheim-Chester disease. Amyloidosis is very, very, very uncommon. It may be primary or secondary. It's due to extracellular deposition of amyloid and the imaging findings are going to be nonspecific. It can be localized where you see a soft tissue mass with calcifications, but that's not really going to help you. Systemically, it can involve the retroperitoneum, or again, you see a retroperitoneal soft tissue that over time could calcify, uh, but again, a very, very tough diagnosis to make prospectively. We'll finish off with extramedullary hematopoiesis. Now, this we see uh, not uncommonly, um, and this is due to ectopic deposition of uh, hematopoietic tissue outside of the bone marrow. You often see it in context of patients who have um, hemoglobinopathies, perhaps myelofibrosis, and things like leukemia, where you have the need for um, developing uh, bone marrow that's outside of the uh, bone marrow, uh, normal places of bone marrow development. It can occur in the liver, spleen, lymph nodes. When it occurs in the retroperitoneum, it often looks like paravertebral masses, but this presacral space is a, is a common location and it can look soft tissue like this in 2007, didn't change over three years in the patient who I believe had myelofibrosis. Um, it can also contain a variable amount of fat, as you can see in this case, um, a patient with soft tissue and fatty components. Now there's a differential for this, but in the context of this patient, this was deemed to be extramedullary hematopoiesis. And so the key things that you're gonna look for are any skeletal changes um, that can be seen with uh, things like myelofibrosis, perhaps signs of iron overload that can be seen in patients of leukemia, and of course, the presacral mass. And if you see stability over time, think that it could be extramedullary hematopoiesis. So that's our last non-neoplastic entity that I wanted to discuss. And let's sort of circle back to the objectives before getting to the unknown cases. So over the last uh, 50 minutes or so, these are the objectives that we went through. We talked about the tricompartmental model of the retroperitoneum that's built around the kidney. And to that, we sort of added this concept of interfascial planes that allow communication between different compartments. We then went through some imaging features of retroperitoneal neoplasms, um, the three sarcomas, liposarcoma, leiomyosarcoma, and undifferentiated uh, pleomorphic sarcomas. We talked about a few neurogenic tumors. Remember the target sign with neurofibromas. I remember the hypervascularity of parasympathetic tumors, metastases, lymphoma as well. Remember lymphoma, the lifts the aorta. We talked about the sandwich sign. We talked about lymphoma enveloping structures not causing damage or obstruction. Then we talked about a few cystic neoplasms, namely lymphatic malformations and tailgate cysts. We finished off with these non-neoplastic retroperitoneal processes. What I want you to remember for retroperitoneal fibrosis is that it's um, anterolateral infrarenal aorta, okay? And it's a dynamic disease, has an active stage, or an early stage, or a late stage, and we can use imaging potentially to differentiate that. Erdheim chester is always a fun uh, thing to think about when you see these perinephric soft tissues surrounding the kidneys, making it look like a hairy kidney with these characteristic bony lesions. You gotta think of Erdheim chester. And amyloidosis, I mentioned here, but it is quite nonspecific and a very tough diagnosis to make prospectively. So let's cycle back to our objectives. First case, uh, everyone who got this right, you can pat them on the back. Liposarcoma, large fat-containing mass, the perirenal space pushing the right kidney anteriorly. Our second case was leiomyosarcoma, a mass in the retroperitoneum, majority of which is outside of the vessel, but you certainly see a component that's invading the IVC here. So that's a leiomyosarcoma. 
This was lymphoma. Lymphoma is lifting the aorta off the spine, enveloping uh, the uh, vessels, not causing any degree of uh, obstruction within this left kidney over here. This was a tail gut cyst, uh, pardon the spelling over there. Uh, also retrorectal hematoma. Uh, so if you got that uh, as an answer, you'd be correct. This multiloculated cystic mass in the presacral space, uh, enhancement of the septations in the periphery, you gotta think of tail gut cysts. Remember, these can degenerate into malignancy, so you gotta take them out if possible. And last but not least was uh, Erdheim Chester disease hairy kidney, this perinephric soft tissue surrounding the kidneys with sclerotic lesions surrounding the metadiaphyseal regions of, uh, of long bones. So with that, that's a little tour of the retroperitoneum. Uh, thank you everyone for your attention. There's been a bunch of comments and uh, uh, I'll open it up for some questions that people have and we'll see uh, if I can get through them. All right, so we have a few people with that, with uh, answering the cases. So thank you so much for your participation there. I'll certainly, uh, we'll certainly have a look at that. Um, let's see if we can announce uh, some winners over here. So we'll just uh, put that aside for the moment. Let's see in the Q and A, nothing right now. To everyone writing in, um, thank you so much. You're so kind to take a moment to to uh, to th thank me. I'm so Look, happy to be able to do this. Have, uh, one person raise their hand. Let's see if I'm going to allow him to talk, and we'll see if they have a question. Yeah, absolutely. Roman, are you here? Do you have a question? No, no that's working. Uh, if anyone has a question, they can add it into this Q and A section or put it in the question or the live chat. And also, there's my email here. So if anyone has a question, the uh, later on, feel free to you can get in touch with me, and I'll. I have some free time nowadays, so I'm happy to answer them. <laughs> All right, perfect. Uh, as we bring this to a close, I want to thank you, Dr. Mather, for your time today. Thanks to all you guys for participating in our noon conference. A reminder that this presentation will be available on demand on our website. Please find it at mrionline.com and sign up for future uh, conferences. We have one again tomorrow and the rest of the week, also available on our website. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you.